actually have to press the button if you intend to record an event. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much for attending this panel, Critical Pedagogies for a Post-Literate Age Towards a Post-Human Humanities. I'm just going to offer some brief introductory remarks on some of the topics that uh, led us to create this panel and then hand it over to our other three amazing panelists. So it's no secret that post-secondary educators at all levels, from tenured profs to teaching assistants, have been putting in inordinate amounts of time of overtime since the start of the pandemic. Faculty have shouldered the whole burden of transitioning their courses online, which has required many to develop new types of expertise. As a result, things that we're not normally expected to do, but do anyways, such as teaching our students how to write, how to com communicate their ideas effectively, and how to develop their critical capacities, have slipped between the cracks that formed in the time that we spent making our courses accessible, correcting errors in Brightspace's auto-captioning software, answering panic student emails, and remaining supportive during their times of crisis. Each of these tasks can be related to what Stefano Harney and Fred Moten call the more than professional. Moten and Harney contrast the enclosure of the university commons within a mass professionalizing model with what they call the under commons, which inhabits the spaces of rupture and fugitivity within the university itself. Thus, these subterranean shifts in tasks related to the more than professional, uh, forgive my teaching assistant here, Eddie, for the intrusion, um, may signify more than anything an assault against the undercommons itself, against the last remaining holdouts who stubbornly maintain that the university can be realized as both a place of refuge and a place of enlightenment. One of the main challenges that we confronted was students coming into our classes not knowing how to write a grammatical sentence, much less how to write a well-structured essay. Initially, our thought was that this reflected a systemic failure at all levels of education, including the K-12 system, to adequately prepare our students for their university coursework. But along with this came the question of how much universities expect students to show up with an already advanced knowledge of higher literacy skills. At the same time, confronting this issue called into question the extent to which we rely on written methods of evaluation to assign numerical grades to a fairly narrow, narrow conceptualization of our students' competencies. Perhaps what we're witnessing here is not a failure to teach the basic tools of literacy, but the development of new forms of neo-literacy or hyper-literacy to which the humanities disciplines have not yet been readily able to adapt. For Paulo Freire, literacy involves more than just reading and writing. It involves developing an awareness of ourselves as social beings embedded in a linguistic, historical, and political context. This latter aspect is what uniquely constitutes us as human, according to Freire. We come into education as incomplete beings, aware of our own incompleteness. Humanizing pedagogy completes us by providing us with the tools to see ourselves as beings embedded with a, within a world situation that is at least partially under our control. But both humanization and dehumanization are possible outcomes of education. The latter typically results from the distortion of the aims of the former. The most egregious and commonplace example of this, thinks Freire, is that of the liberal educator who imposes their understanding of the world onto their students. Even when done in earnest, this approach practically ensures that the students will gain no agency in the process. A truly liberatory pedagogy is one which constitutes its students as subjects, rather than treating them merely as objects, that is, as passive recipients of knowledge. In fact, for Freire, humanizing pedagogy deconstructs the teacher-student binary altogether. Humanizing pedagogy is co-intentional. It is against the totalitarian imposition of preconceived academic models and hierarchies. Instead, Freire conceives of it as an act of revolutionary love and faith in humanity. So Freire contrasts two concepts of education. First is the banking concept which frames education as one-way knowledge transfer, as commodified information exchange. Then there's the problem-posing concept, which is part of a humanizing pedagogy. The problem-posing concept resolves the teacher-student contradiction by immersing both in a dialogical communicative praxis, which is led by the intentionality that the students develop in realizing their own concrete world situation. 
In stark contrast with the banking model, the problem posing model thus constructs knowledge and agency at the same time as it constitutes subjectivity. Education is seen as an open-ended process of becoming, as unceasing transformation and flux. Problem posing education is revolutionary futurity, Freire writes. Hence, it is prophetic and as such hopeful. In other words, problem posing education constitutes humanity as a form of historical subjectivity. Time is the potentially transformative dimension of rupture which is capable of breaking through the static monolith of education as it is conceived by the banking concept. This is because temporality for Freire is the unique dimension of human freedom. And so humanizing pedagogy is broadly speaking the ideal model that is espoused by the humanities. Granted, we may not always be successful at fully replicating this model, but still, it is this type of a model that I will tentatively presume is foundational to the disciplines that we are here collectively calling the humanities. Certain aspects of a humanizing pedagogy have been especially difficult to replicate in an online setting, particularly the problem posing concept of education. An extreme example of this is in the online asynchronous format, which tends to transform teachers into content creators and students into passive consumers. However, such challenges are not exclusive to teaching online or to the context of this pandemic. One of the key features of the neoliberal university has been the intensification of the banking concept and the divestment from a humanizing model of education, leading to the contraction of the humanities to core. Nevertheless, for many humanities educators that I've spoken with, and perhaps for many of you here, the experience of teaching over the past year has brought such contradictions to a flashpoint. The fact that many of our students are coming into our classrooms ill-equipped to write a basic grammatical sentence isn't inherently problematic, but it does seem symptomatic of a generalized trend towards a model that rewards students for shallow regurgitation instead of the intentional incorporation of knowledge. At the same time, however, shifting emphasis here, we must remain critical of the emphasis that we as humanities educators place on literacy which is an ill-defined concept at best. To recap, for Freire, literacy is not reducible to reading and writing skills. Literacy essentially requires humanization, which means the development of critical capacity and intentionality. One of the foundational presuppositions of Freire's view is that the illiterate are subject to domination in a world that is hierarchically oriented around the concept of literacy. But the concept of post-literacy radically calls into question this essential link between literacy and humanity, or humanicity, the forced conjunction of humanity and historicity. If literacy has its correlate in the society of the book, then post-literacy has its correlate in a society which comprehends a multiplicity of new meanings that are associated with the words reading and writing. If the essential link between literacy and humanicity can't be taken for granted, then what we are left with is the troubling notion that what we call humanity might simply be the name for a historically contingent episteme, which developed in response to the reading writing technologies that emerged in the early Renaissance. In the words of Father John Culkin, which were often repeated by Marshall McLuhan, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. If Culkin and McLuhan are correct, then the concept of post-literacy has, properly speaking, a double signification. It simultaneously points to both the decline of traditional literacy and to the emergence of a new hyper-literacy in response to the highly networked information societies which we inhabit today. By extension, if the notion of the human exists merely as an epiphenomenon of a predominantly literary culture, then the dawning of a post-literate society may also signify the emergence of new post-human forms of subjectivity and intelligence. And so this leads to what I have described as the dual frustration in the predicament that we humanities educators are currently finding ourselves in. On the one hand, we are frustrated by how the humanities disciplines have been forcefully recruited into a dehumanizing pedagogical praxis, which re-entrenches the neoliberalized banking model of education. On the other hand, we're frustrated that the humanities can't be imagined as anything more, as part of a transformative pedagogical praxis. 
Instead of accepting the negative equation of post-literate with dehumanizing as given, such a praxis would respond by associating post-literate with humanizing. This move would seemingly gesture towards the seemingly oxymoronic post-human humanities. This is a term that I borrow from Rosie Braidotti. Braidotti situates our current theoretical moment at the convergence between post-humanism and post-anthropocentrism. That is, at the decline of both classical humanism and of the unique privileging of human perspective. So things like the rise of interdisciplinarity, the proliferation of various critical studies disciplines, and the new connections being built between the sciences and the humanities all signal the erosion of the classical human concept from within. Accordingly, post-anthropocentrism calls on us to decenter the human as the presumed subject of knowledge in reference to this shift, as well as other shifts that show the non-human agency in what had hitherto been thought of as exclusively humanist modes of conception, things like planetary agency, ecological agencies, and so forth. Thus, a post-human humanities would use the critical tools developed by the humanities in order to think the emergence of the post-human subject. The critical task of thinking through what a post-human humanities might look like already situates us in the rupture, which makes it possible to reformulate the essential link between literacy and humanicity, thus enabling new patterns of creative, post-literate, post-disciplinary, and non-hierarchical knowledge synthesis to emerge. So these are some of the provocations that inspired this panel. We do not purport to provide easy answers which can be assimilated as best practices by the neoliberal universities. Instead, we seek only to pose the problems which seem most pertinent to our contemporary situation. With that, it is my great joy to introduce our other panelists, Kristen Lewis, Janine Waltz, and Mark Zion, who will hopefully fill in or else productively add to the many gaps that I have undoubtedly left in my opening remarks. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Anthony. Um, so I think you guys were intending on going alphabetically, if I recall correctly. Um, so that would put Kristen next. That sounds good. That's good. Thank you. And thank you, Anthony. Um, so I'm going to um, rely on the uh, PowerPoint format. Um, let's see, I put it into slide share, slideshow mode. Does that work? Are we seeing it? It appears so that I can see the slides along the side, but I can, I can still see the side that you're on. Um, there you there. go. Now it's okay. just the, the slideshow. So I wanted to um, take up the uh, the words post-human in the call to this um, pedagogy panel um, and um, center in a way that is perhaps um, sort of against the grain of certain parts of post-humanism on the um, human in post-human and um, to talk about ways that um, even through the digital and even through the technological interventions and even through calls that are um, necessary and good to consider the post-human, um, that um, the patterns of authority set up between students and teacher continue to be um, conditioned, I think, in some fundamental ways um, by uh, gender and the connections between uh, gender and desire and the hierarchized relations these set up in a classroom. So I'm going to um, explore this a little bit and, and also say that um, at the end, I think um, there might be a certain way through. And I'm grateful in this presentation for um, the friendship of um, Ryan Beaton, who's not here, but who many of you know, who's um, a PhD student in the law school and a member of the Law Cosa faculty. So the thinking and writing that we've done together over the last year has, um, helped to generate some of this thought, although um, the errors in it, I take uh, squarely on my own shoulders um, and, I, and I cite some of his texts with permission. So I wanted to start just at the beginning, not to posit an origin, but just to remember that um, 
were all formed because of the meeting in some way of an egg and a, and a sperm, um, a kind of fact of our biology that I think is sometimes um, uh, overlooked. It's at least something that I, I tend to forget. And um, it's something that Ili Garay's work tends to uh, remind me of. And so even an 88 year old Ili Garay con continues to um, emphasize uh, life as foundational uh, to philosophy. So starting with this starting point of life, the meeting of um, egg and sperm, I wanted to talk about um, how that sets up relations of authority between students and teachers um, and how we can uh, exploit those for both um, good and for ill in our tasks as um, caretakers of our students. And um, I count friends as students and uh, teachers as students and um, think of the student teacher relationship as, um, as always fluid and something that happens dialogically whenever two people come together who um, want to learn something. So there's always this um, sort of demand if one is filling out forms and proposals and endless proposals to propose to consider um, what our research question is. And about this, um, uh, Ryan says, how fully you crack and splatter will determine the range of versatility. So I like to remember this as a reminder of the vulnerability that informs the sorts of research questions we do and do not pursue and the sorts of research questions we do and do not encourage our students to pursue. Uh, as my friend says, a scholarly subject matter is at best a scaffolding for clamoring to a clearer view of your own inner landscape and how you work problems through. Eventually you must arrive at a problem, not necessarily a scholarly one that says this, this only you can work through. And so I think of this as a, um, a goal of scholarship and something that pedagogy can support students in working towards, even across the digital, even through the abstractions of the neoliberal university, um, centering on this human problem of um, coming to know uh, who we are. And he describes thinking thus, to learn how to think is to learn how to sift slowly over a long period of time. So much preliminary housekeeping is in order, patiently tracing the grooves of your own thoughts, the familiar paths the mind likes to follow, its daily gratifications and irritations as it glides along, praising itself for hitting a wall, feeling exposed or launching a rebellion, etc. Painstaking observation that then has to be shifted to others as well, back and forth to yourself, comparing notes, making guesses, adjusting hypotheses. The conditions for genuine thinking to develop then are rare. Independence, free time, a sort of cheerful disgruntlement, a curiosity that threatens to turn morbid, but is held in check by careful discipline. Um, and a joy in taking solitary paths, a God, if any, who does not condemn in moral terms, does not condemn at all. Also friends or lucky finds who come along at the right time and the courage or madness to crave seeing, crave knowing even shameful and hard truths that cannot be unseen. So if we take um, thinking as uh, no less and no more serious than this, um, then I, I propose that it um, gives us gives us a frame in which to um, consider the, the job of supporting students um, in terms that don't always shirk responsibility often to the um, you know, damaging structural conditions that still need to be interrogated. Um, and my friend reminds us that the pilgrimage of the would-be thinker and philosopher into the desert is a trial of exhaustion and boredom, not nearly enough of a stage desert, Nietzsche, to lure many spirits far along its path. The everyday in its most bland, drained of the pleasures and rewards that used to stimulate, the eye of the needle through which the thinker must pass is in fact a debilitating tunnel of tedium. Here where nothing is working and nothing excites anymore is a place where I can be reborn, where I have to let go of all that stimulated in the past cold as a new razor blade. And so if we take seriously the work our students are doing um, and see it as a uh, pilgrimage into a desert, then we can take seriously also our responsibility to not romanticize the desert, but also uh, I, I would venture not abandon our students um, there either. Um, and that requires uh, work on the self, not necessarily in the um, 
Foucauldian sense uh, of a cr critical work on the self, but an actual work on ourselves as teachers that takes seriously um, this task that we've been charged with. And I think about this in my work with um, young dance students. There's so many things to let go of on the way to yourself. So one of the things that I propose um, stands in the way of um, the way to ourself is this question of gender and hunger. Um, Bell Hooks puts it that every female wants to be loved by a male. Every woman wants to love and be loved by the males in her life, whether gay or straight, bisexual or celibate. She wants to feel the love of father, grandfather, uncle, brother, or male friend. Our collective hunger is so intense it rends us. And yet we dare not speak it for fear it will be mocked, pitied, shamed. To speak our hunger for male love would demand that we name the intensity of our lack and loss. The male bashing that was so intense when contemporary feminism first surfaced more than 30 years ago was in part the rageful cover-up of the shame women felt, not because men refused to share their power, but because we could not seduce, cajole, or entice men to share their emotions, to love us. So uh, if we accept that this journey into the desert, the desert of um, uh, true thinking, where we want our students to go, where we ourselves are wandering, um, that one of the conditions of the desert are these deeply entrenched um, patterns that set up relations of authority such that um, students in the contemporary university have a hunger for daddy and a relative aversion for mummy, um, such that uh, our male colleagues tend to get a sort of automatic deference, whereas um, as a female colleague, we don't um, enjoy the same privilege. And I'm not saying that this has to be something that we uh, that causes jealousy between um, the genders, but something to be aware of um, and something that could cause us to ask what form should our teaching take given the pervasiveness of hunger for male love? How do we cultivate genuine love, both male and female and other others, which requires a process of maturation that is not necessarily the same as the one Bell Hooks outlines? How do we as teachers learn to love well? And I want to talk about this um, because it comes to the core of this issue that I see throughout the university. On the one hand, students of all genders who prefer male authority to female authority. Uh, and on the other, female professors who don't, do not get the deference and respect male ones get, get. And this sets up a whole range of power dynamics that cut across generations of scholarship. And so exploding the lens outward to see our role as tenders of the future generations, how do we do something to change this dynamic whereby female students aspire to be not like their female professors, but like their male ones and abandon often their femininity in the process? And how, how do we tend to this reality that as um, perhaps uh, I may have missed the slide here, but um, if anyone's seen um, Fight Club, um, there's a certain quote in Fight Club about, um, or a generation raised by women um, is another woman what this situation really needs. Um, and so um, in a cultural landscape devoid of um, authentic male love, full of hunger for maleness um, and full also of females occupying caretaking roles in disproportionate amounts. There's a kind of surfeit of female love fed to um, many students in their um, early childhoods that makes them relate to female authority along quite different lines, not hungering for it, but um, uh, avoiding it, not wanting it. To, um, it's just too much of mummy. And so my friend Beaton asks, not necessarily in connection to these questions I raise, but in general, um, let hunger in. You have to hu let hunger in if you want to discover and learn to crave a new kind of food. And for me, the question is, how do we grow up? How do we get over this deficit of the daddy and the surfeit of the mummy so that we can relate to each other as friends, whether students or teachers or otherwise occupied in the um, shifting, you know, kind of institutional roles that we're cast into. How can we learn a new kind of hunger, one that um, frees us from these deeply entrenched patterns of gender relations that I don't think are nece necessarily um, you know, determinate? And so I've been bringing this into my own teaching work with a young dancer I'm working with, a, a young female dancer. 
I asked her to go into the studio yesterday um, and to ask what her relationship to authority is. What kinds of authority do you crave, I said. What kinds do you avoid? What kinds do you hunger for? What, what do you become repelled by? And then in this choreographic space where we're kind of delightfully free of um, theoretical considerations divorced from the body, um, she was able to answer these questions in a really direct way, saying things like, um, the push off from the womb feels connected to a desire to be validated, to be praised. Um, it feels like I attribute a sense of mystery to male authority. To be male is viewed as interesting, unique, mysterious. Not to me, she says, but I think it's sometimes received this way. This mystery breeds intrigue and even more so when in the context of an authority figure. So this honest um, confessional, I think it's not something to be you know, criticized or shamed, but something to, to acknowledge as it um, informs relations, whether digitized or otherwise, in ways that I think um, exceed the terms of the current, you know, constrictions of the pandemic. Um, and finally, in closing, I'd like to bring all of this back to my original invocation of the sperm and the egg and bring that moment up to the moment of um, birth, a moment that is um, deeply ambiguous and ambiguity that my friend uh, Ryan gets at quite clearly when he says, the battle with addiction is not always what you think, or the battle with addiction as popularly, popularly understood and medically diagnosed is just a particular case, a kind of sedimentation of the default condition, the wrapping and twisting of our emotional needs around habits that are emotional dead ends. The crippling of the human soul is inevitable. Before I am anything, I'm reaching out in blind desperation to the world thrust into the moment of birth, for instance, and I am scarred by whatever reaches back, even love and protection. We scream for our scars to be tended to and help ourselves to whatever echoes back. We pick up the pieces of self-tending here and there. We cultivate the patch of desert as a voice crying through the wilderness the desert of thought even as scholars in pursuit of a research question, as uh, teachers guiding students to find their own research question. So this, a voice crying through the wilderness, that is the raging beauty of being born. The gentle cooing of the parent can nourish only if it also recalls and holds in balance the mad shaking of the wilderness, the kingdom spread around us that we mostly unlearn to see because of the dead ends latched onto to ease out of the dead ends, to shake in madness and exhilaration, to be reborn is what every great tradition teaches. Here greatness lies in blasting through the spiritual paralysis of our everyday dead ends. The addict is a special case only because slow crisis has come to the surface with nasty clarity. Addiction may be a gateway as spiritual desert is a gateway. And I posit it's a gateway whether at the extreme ends of addiction or at the sh uh, shallow ends of slow boredom with the everyday uh, that we pass through on our own way to the desert of finding uh, our, our own research questions and they're a way of being true friends to our students. So I posit that we relate as friends, as children, uh, orphaned, but not without friends. Our friends are our teachers, as Kafka says, for we are abandoned like children lost in the wood. We're abandoned to the neoliberal university. We're abandoned to the moment of birth. We're abandoned um, to the conditions of the desert. But we have each other, and we have this opportunity of a friendship that can um, exceed the hierarchized relations of the dominant um, gender regime, um, something that um, Stephen Garlick speaks to when he talks about um, friendship. Citing Nietzsche, what good is all the work, all the art of our work works of art if we lose that high art, the art of festivals. The friend should be the festival of the earth to you and an anticipation of the overman, the overperson, the overhuman. Um, and Garlic posits that um, friendship, um, if read through the lens of Foucault, can help us to locate friendship as a key site of challenge to the modern gender regime and its underlying discourse of heterosexuality. So the um, deep patterns of authority set up by the modern regime of heterosexuality, I posit, can be undone through the right kind of friendship, which should be the model of teaching. So I propose we move from uh, a notion of mother or father, uh, daddy professor, uh, the good guy or mummy professor, the 
uh, sort of breast we want to avoid to a model of nests and freedom and to see teaching as the art of being a good friend. And love as the force that uh, moves us through that journey of the desert of thought, the end. Awesome, thanks so much, Kristen. That was uh, beautiful as always. <laughs> I love the way your brain works. Uh, it's always really inspirational. Um, and so with that, I think our, our next speaker is going to be Janine Bultz. We are all ready to go. Okay, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I will uh, also share my screen for some slides. And um, Yes, here we go. So I will be uh, talking um, about my about um, the neoliberal university about commodification of higher education, and I will do that from a perspective of critical pedagogy. Um, maybe I will start just saying from where I come from. Uh, you can hear I have an accent. I'm. Uh, um, originally from Austria, and I have been working there in the students' union at, uh, in Austria, but also in, uh, at the European level uh, for many years, and um, have been involved in these discussions and in the research and in the questions of um, what uh, was also proposed by Anthony in this beginning of like, how do we develop uh, learning and teaching in university environments? How can we have co-ownership of education, how can students have agency, um, how can we understand education as a mean to, as a tool to empower us to develop action, how can we use this space in universities to develop critical thought and critical ideas. And um, well, I have to say, uh, to be upfront, it's, I don't think uh, that the university is the ideal space for that, uh, because it is um, a neoliberal um, endeavor itself. And um, so I will talk a little bit about this development and uh, hope that we can discuss that maybe afterwards. Um, so I will be begin with um, higher education um, history a little bit just to provide a background because very often if we are today criticizing uh, higher education and how we learn in universities we are coming to the point where we say yeah but like earlier last century decades ago it was all better so we tend to romanticize the old way of how universities were working um, actually it wasn't that great and we often forget that, and we often forget that it was a, lot, a huge struggle to open up higher education from super elitist to just still elitist, but less elitist. Um, so when we come back to how higher education started and how universities were founded um, in, uh, in European uh, countries mainly, um, it is started as a as a means to like um, further educate uh, people in philosophy, in uh, theology. So it was very religious uh, from the beginnings. And it was, the aim was to create a space where people um, and especially um, in, could follow their theological ideas and train the next generations in that. So it was um, very elitist, it was only male, it was only for, uh, for rich people, so for like working class peasants, the normal people was completely un not understandable what happens behind these huge gray walls. So if you see old European universities, they're all huge buildings, very thick walls. No one really can enter it. Um, big, huge doors guarded. So it's not a place that is open to anyone. Um, so that was not, it's not a very nice idea especially except from the few people maybe who worked in there. So um, with industrialization, there comes some change in that. And that is of course how it is linked to what we understand today as neoliberal or capitalist um, ideas of education. 
So in the 18th century, suddenly there were cuts. We have class struggles. We have the uh, enlightenment. We have the idea of more people wanting to get education. And so universities have to open up a little bit. But still, it has this idea of like having the one professor that is all above and knows everything. And then there's the little apprentices who come and like worship the great professor and try to learn from him. Um, and all, of course, that is in a male form. Um, so with the 20th century, with the beginnings of women's movements, um, we see that more and more women um, are able to enter higher education, but still that's a huge fight for them, for the first women. That was not just an easy task, especially not getting up and getting tenure and getting professorships. And in the recent years, we see there's, that there's still um, Lots of, uh, we, we just start a discussion of people who are excluded from higher education because of their racialized, uh, because of their uh, disabilities, of mental health issues, and many more. So all these points of class, gender, being racialized, disabilities, there are still reasons why people cannot attend higher education. So we still have higher education systems and universities as an elitist project. Um, it just has widened up what, as wide as it is needed for a capitalist society. So what we see here, and I quote here Foucault, because he has been working a lot about the role of educational institutions and how they are, um, how they are used in, this, in our uh, neoliberal system. They are not used for like, I don't know, creating great ideas to bring society forward and open up and have, um, have a, a better society altogether. They're used for training skilled workers who are following the norms of society, who are um, fitting in the standards that enable better productivity, that enable better economy. So we are learning that from I don't know, in our schools, because the hours are set like the work clocks in the fabric, in, in like um, in, in the fabric, we know that from um, how we are trained to write in specific words, how to produce output in, in academics, everything is standardized, normalized, and everything is like targeted to productivity. So there's a reproduction of elite going on. Um, so, so, and what happens here in this idea is that neoliberal strategies target every aspect of our lives, as we know. We know that there, and so is education. So education becomes a marketplace. It becomes a commodity. It becomes something that the university as the institution is selling to us as learners. We go there, we buy our education, we buy our degrees. And there's quite some places uh, where you really can just buy your degree. Um, but um, in the end, also, if we study hard, we just do everything to fit in the norms of the university, to um, be submissive to the standards of the university, and then we will get our degree. Um, so while we can see over the past decades, especially since the 1970s, um, we have a movement that more people are entering higher education. There's more higher education institutions, there's more students, there's more, um, there's like, we try to widen access for disadvantaged groups, but in the end, it is always still the idea of, um, opening their universities as far as it's needed for the market. So since our um, societies and our economy moves towards more digitalization, more complex um, industries, we need people who are more skilled. So that is why universities are widened because we need what is, uh, uh, is uh, named as human capital. And I have put together here quite a bunch and I'm sure that's not an exhaustive list, there's so many more words, but there's a lot of passwords. And if you read universities' strategies, also the one from um, 
UDIC, if we read strategies of policymakers for higher education, we find all these things. So it's about human capital, it's about um, increasing student numbers, it's about um, the question of how to secure funding. It is like developing public public private partnerships. We are always talking about tuition fees. Um, and all of these things are, are, are like little tiny elements that are used to create this commodity of education. Um, so they are like, it's like producing a car, we make sure that it is working, we make sure that the drivers are involved, we make sure that there's quality assurance. Um, so it is, um, and with employability, we make sure that there is actually someone who wants to drive the car in the end. We have all these elements in our higher education system. And very often we just like, also even if you're like in a critical mindset, we just take on this language and these words and like use them in our everyday language. So I just want to create some awareness of how deep every one of us is in that mindset because we live in it. Um, I wanted just to emphasize a brief example of how, what that does to a system of higher education. So uh, I know that there's lots of uh, very romantic ideas about the old higher education systems in Europe. Um, but what happened in the last 20 years there is um, that the very diverse landscape of higher education institutions became the European Higher Education Union. And um, well, in the first space, you think, oh, that's so awesome. That means students in Europe can now study at every university in every country. Um, that means that students can just travel. They have like mobility programs and their degrees are accepted everywhere. Isn't that awesome? Well, the problem is that was, well, that's a nice side outcome, but the idea behind uh, harmonizing the system of the whole of the whole European um, union within the Bologna process, that's the name for it, is just to, it's the goal, and I stated it here in one of the strategy paper, is to make Europe the most competitive and most dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world. And you find similar strategy statements in all countries or economic spaces in the world, um, even more dominant in, in China, for example, um, but you find it everywhere. And so the idea is that we create educational systems that will support our idea of the economy. We create the skilled labor we need for our economy to be able to compete in the world. And that is what we find at every level of our educational system. We find this idea of competition and every one of us knows it. Every one of us knows the tension of like applying for a program, applying for being part in a panel, applying for um, being part in a journal, whatever. We all know that and it makes us sick and it like feels hard and it's like stressful, but it is, it is the core of higher education. We compete every day for everything. We compete for access, we compete for grades. Our co colleagues in university are not our friends. We are not learning together. We are competitors because only one of us will be top of the class and only one of us will get in the master program. So the system is not supporting collaboration. So we are often saying like, oh, it's so nice to be more interdisciplinary. It's so nice to collaborate, to work together. Well, in the end, the system is not built for that. Um, so um, and then so we have are more you have the competition on the one side and then on the one side and the other side we have lots of problems that come from that. Just for example, brain drain. We have so many people because of the competition amongst educational institutions. We have so many people from lower income countries moving, for example, to Canada to study here. That means that there is a lack of well-educated people, of future professors. Um, in many countries in the world because people just leave. And we just, like we, the rich countries, we just suck their ideas and their brains and use them for our economy because it's competition, it's not collaboration. Um, on the other hand, we individualize systemic exclusion. 
if you have people who cannot access education because of mental mental health issues, disabilities, uh, because they're racialized, because lots of things, we say, well, no, it's your problem. You know, you might not be smart enough. So that's the other thing that capitalism does. It individualizes. And where is there space for critical thinking? I'm not so sure. So yes, there is a very nice idea in critical pedagogy, considering universities as agents for change. And I have here a picture of a big student's protest that was in 2009. I was a part of that. I was squatting that audience, that auditorium for months. It's big fun, lots of critical ideas and critical discussions. Um, so there is truly an idea of universities being um, political spaces, being spaces of cr critical thought um, and of transformation. So there is happening something of that, yeah? And there's happening some self-organization, there's happening critical thinking and change. But what I want to, so all of that, what um, Anthony was also speaking in the beginning about, um, but still I want to pose to not end too hopeful, the question that if we know how universities have been designed and still our elitist constructs, can they ever be agents of change? Or does it just mean that we as critical minds just become part of the elite and in the end don't want to change it? Awesome. Thanks, Janine. You touched on like a lot of things that I've <laughs> been wrestling with myself. Um, but you know, I hadn't I had never considered the the brain drain element that is like sort of a new this is a new angle that I hadn't even considered about how the um yeah, the the brightest students from around the globe will, you know, leave their countries of origin in order to go to the schools that are the most competitive. And so as a result, and may never go back home again, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's something I hadn't really thought about. So thank you for that. Um, and our next speaker is going to be Mark Sion. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. I've really uh, enjoyed the presentation so far. And I think that we're all um, sort of interconnected in, in the questions that we're um, posing and, and thinking through. I'll just apologize at the outset for being a little bit on the brief side, perhaps mercifully, because it's you know, the last one uh, on the panel, just because um, I'm sort of um, uh, performing uh, what I'll be uh, talking about or, or trying to perform it in, in teaching my um, Green Legal Theory course um, this semester, which I sort of prioritized and um, had a very good seminar today, but it was an, it ended an hour ago. So correspondingly, I may not be quite as dynamic here. So, um, but yeah, just to, just to sort of say a bit more about how I understand the dialogical um, method, like very resonant with what um, Anthony was saying. Um, I, I just, um, Note how for um, Ferry, the concern is fundamentally about um, beginning uh, where students are. Um, so it's this process of mutual uh, engagement that requires, um, as Heidegger would say, that the teacher is actually more educable than the students. So um, Ferry will differentiate the dialogical model from the banking model, um, as Anthony mentioned, um, and that traditional hierarchical approach, the teacher is positioned as the master and the one who disseminates you know, the static body of knowledge to the student, student recipients um, who have to be filled up like empty vessels. Um, Rancière points out the irony that the best the student could ever do is reach the level of the teacher who becomes a sort of asymptote beyond which uh, discovery Eventual uh, surprise thinking cannot exist. So instead, um, the dialogical model um, is open to surprises and the questions that uh, arise um, as a result of interaction, listening, and rethinking over time. Anthony spoke eloquently about that in terms of becoming historical dimension of Ferry. Um, although the teacher um, may have more experience than the students within a particular area, especially if you're teaching a theory course where many students don't have any uh, theory background, the emphasis is not on encyclopedic coverage, um, but ensuring that what is covered can be integrated into the student's existing framework uh, and into their lives. Um, in the process, students' prior assumptions will be uh, slowly 
and often indirectly brought into question. Um, so Spivak therefore refers to education as the non-coercive rearrangement of desire. Importantly, um, the dialogical method is deeply political for Ferry. Um, it works against the grain. It refuses to naturalize the existing ecological, social, and political conditions. Um, and it uh, does not pretend to be neutral, speaking ex cathedra from some, you know, Archimedean or more recently liberal uh, point that, that sort of lies above life and heuristics. Um, rather, it understands the teacher and the students to be situated within a field of significations, narratives, and frames um, that um, are contested. So one of the things I actively trying to try to contest, I think, you know, Janina um, draws a, a, us to an important paradox, is the, the importance of interrogating the, the, our formative context, the neoliberal university um, itself, which is something I try to do um, with my students uh, in, in my course, not on day one. <laughs> um, so when we speak about teaching, um, I think the context it does matter. So um, I'll just say that a lot of my um, reflections uh, come out of yeah, teaching the screen legal theory course um, this semester. Um, I've actually been been really lucky, uh, not in terms of uh, my pay scale or anything of that nature, but because of the, the course was in the calendar because my, my supervisor retired and, and created it. And then um, I was able to sort of redesign it from the ground up in line with my own you know, interests and, and research. And so we're fortunate because it's just 14 students and we meet in two uh, synchronous uh, Zoom sessions um, every week for, for 80 minutes. Um, and I'm happy to sort of go into, um, you know, how I approach the dialogical method in terms of, you know, evaluation, combination of short assignments, short papers, and, um, and, and so on. Um, but I think we can leave a lot of that for discussion. I'm just going to um, gesture toward a few paradoxes that I've uh, encountered. So um, the first is that um, effective teaching takes tremendous preparation, time, and energy. I'm actually pretty burnt out at this time in the semester, I'll just, I'll just say. Um, uh, but that's um, what the neoliberal university, as Janina drew out so well, um, punishes for, for allocating. And that you know, competitive um, paradigm, the, you know, the system you know, really isn't built for, for collaboration. And so at the moment that I'm exposing students to symbolesis and, and Haraway, you know, relationality, the way that um, Pavanelli talks about relations with, with, with more than human existence, um, our, our context you know, punishes um, my ability to sort of uh, draw out this material um, effectively. So um, that's, I think, a, an important one, just as a function of, of being um, within the institution. Um, the second, I think, sort of came up a bit in Kristen's um, remarks, where um, for me, teaching really can't be uh, about you know, the goal is not to be adored. It's not the sort of popularity uh, uh, exercise. Um, but at the same time, um, it has to come out of love uh, for the context of, of teaching, for the students as democratic um, interlocutors, and uh, for the world that ultimately has to be worth uh, transforming. So um, Bell Hooks recounts, not in the material that Kristen was talking about, but in teaching to um, transgress, how um, she'd often have students, you know, who would frown and who just would not like the shift from the banking model to her, her more her version of, of the dialogical method, but they'd sometimes you know come back to see her years later and 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 thank her for um, doing what they ultimately realized you know they needed to to have uh, happen. Um, so um, I think that's the, that's the second um, paradox. The third. Uh, paradox is just that uh, the dialogical method exposes students to um, problems that have to be open-ended, especially in a the theory course, um, in order to engage them critically, um, to have them draw out synthetic connections, to trigger epiphanies, um, but they can sometimes experience that open-endedness, something that really surprised me, you know, comparison to my own experience as a student, they can experience that open-endedness as itself oppressive. Um, so this actually makes the practice of teaching, unlike, you know, sort of the, the banking model where, you know, I can just sort of standardize the lectures, disseminate a certain amount of information, you know, each lecture takes the same amount of time to plan, it would be a lot easier. I think there's sort of a necessary difficulty that has to be born um, if you're going to try to, to, to move toward um, the, the dialogical method. And just experientially, I can say just this week, uh, Tuesday was quite difficult. I, I posed probably too many um, open-ended questions because they're, they're tired at this time in the semester. The, the previous seminar, I had the, the impression that everything was clicking really well. And I thought, okay, great. We'll open things up. We'll let them sort of, um, you know, sort of be, be more responsive. And there were too many pauses. So Today, we had a, a great seminar, but it was it started off by sort of um, 
uh, remastering some of the questions that seemed a bit more um, difficult um, the last day, which often feels very awkward for me. So I sort of alternate between these um, deterritorializing and re-territorializing um, moments where I'm sort of pr pr creating productive um, ambiguity, um, and then also sometimes having to um, make oversimplified uh, uh, re remarks or, or to sort of provide a scaffolding that I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, you know, set up in my own uh, work, but that seems necessary as as a foil, you know, for the students to to respond to and to sort of gain a, a foothold. So I think it's it's this active negotiation, knowing that a lot of students have four other courses that are very much you know within a, a relatively if not banking model then not necessarily a critical um, approach uh, one that you know brings politics actively into question um, then you know they, they need uh, you know a, a bit more um, yeah of the, of the re at, at times um, yeah and of course there are just these these contradictions with um, with grading that um, we're trying to model sort of a more love-based uh, collaborative uh, open approach. And at the end of the day, what hangs over every course at every moment is the fact that I'm responsible you know, for the university. I can't make this as a sessional instructor. I can't make this a pass-fail course um, you know, it, it, as I would like to have. It, it, you know, I have to, to, to hierarchize them for the waiting you know, law firms in the case of half the students who are law students and in the case of the ES students, you know, on their way to sort of the, the, the job market. So um, it definitely sort of limits um, what we can do. So I think that it, the, the best way to understand this is just the, the constant um, navigation of um, paradoxes and uh, just trying to, um, for me, uh, stay with the trouble uh, enjoy the the ecstasies that, that that happen along the way. So Bell Hooks talks about you know even though teaching is devalued in the neoliberal university, when the classroom works well and when students sort of light up and the discussion really um, pops, I think it's the, the best part of the academic experience for me. Definitely you know on par with research or any other um, element. And then um, you know at, at other times. Uh, you know they're, they're tired or um, you know questions have to be reposed or something and it's 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 really uh, difficult and I, I'm perhaps you know oversensitive to the feeling that, that something isn't isn't working on a particular day and I have to sit with that and um, think about how to change things up uh, too so um, yeah that's probably perhaps an over experiential uh, 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 line through my own experience uh, this semester in the context of sort of, of, of the dialogical method. And I'm happy to sort of pick up um, on any questions and appreciate the chance to sort of respond. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, listening to you guys has been great. Um, it's very validating. <laughs> A lot of the thoughts are circling my, my head and um it's funny your 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 um and that comes up a lot the the distaste for grading i actually love grades um but i think it's because i've somehow like revolutionized my approach to them like like as a student um and then now in the way that i kind of use them now that I'm just doing my sort, I'm, I'm just in my first year of my MA, for those that don't know me. So I'm, I'm very new to TAing and being in charge of people's lives with grades. But um, yeah, I think that, that grades can be helpful. I find them very aspiring if you take the competition out of it and you take the, the money out of it. The problem with grades is that if I get a lower grade, I lose funding or I don't get a scholarship or something like that. Um, or you know, you know, the competitions at the end of the year, who has the highest GPA, that sort of thing. But if you take the competition and the money out of it, I find that it's really helpful for gauging, you know, where I'm at. And then, and then I can compare myself just to myself. Did I do better this time around? And that, but without grades at all, I find that I, I don't think I would have any idea where, where I was at in terms of my sort of transitions over time. So anyways, so that's, that's just my alternative perspective on grading. But um, yeah, I think we're, we're going to be moving into uh, more of a discussion uh, sort of period now. Um, I know folks have been sitting for a while, so feel free to get up and stretch your legs or go to the bathroom if you want. Um, because we don't want to run too late, I probably won't take like a formal break. I'll let people that want to just sort of lunch into into talking start doing that but anyone that does need to take a break feel free to turn off your cameras and go do what you need to do for a while and and then jump back in um yeah so so any any does anyone want to want to take the lead on first first responses i have lots of thoughts first, but i'm host so I, I don't want to talk too much <laughs> <clears throat> uh 
Uh, I see that Sarah has her hand up. Oh yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of these um, wonderful papers. Um, listening to all of them, I they've, um, sorry, I'm not gonna be very, uh, very coherent. It's been a very long day, lots of Zoom things on today. It's that time of the, the term where, yeah, I can barely string together a sentence. Um, but, but all of the papers touched on various things inside me. Um, Anthony's and Mark's, you know, this desire to be dialogical, non-hierarchical in my teaching. I do do so much. I I loved Bell Hooks. You know, she was. She was why I wanted to publish in Rutledge, my first book to be in Rutledge, because I read all her books and they were always published by Rutledge when I was younger. And um, um, and anyway, so she was my idol in many ways. But I get into teaching and I'm trying to do this either instinctively or explicitly. And then I encounter what Kristen has brought up and we've discussed this so many times, you know, the gendered aspect where my teaching non-hierarchical is viewed as a lack of authority. And I'm, and I it just like, I'm, I'm constantly being pushed, you know, I try to be that, but then I'm, I'm just, completely discounted as a teacher um and and this is where you know getting into janine's thing you know how are we going to use the university or, or education as an agent for change when we're simply not taken seriously like the way that we teach is not is completely discounted um but what mark said about bell hooks about a student coming to her years later and, and they, I got the same thing in family law a few years ago um, where a student you know came to me years even though I got a lot of criticism about the way that you know sort of my non-hierarchical approach um, but then he came to me you know the next year and said oh you know what actually the way you teach that helped me when with my summer job you know the idea that these are people, you know, um, and but but you know the people in front of us are clients. Anyways, it's just it's just I think as a as a as a woman, I don't know if my male uh, colleagues here um, encounter the same thing, but and I know I'm a white woman, so that's even like it's another. You know, I still have these layers of privilege, um, so I can't even imagine uh, what uh, yeah what my colleagues go through. Um, so I just wanted to, I guess, say that as a, as a starting point. I can maybe respond briefly. I, th <clears throat> I, I was also quite, quite anti-hierarchical when I started teaching and I did pay for it quite a bit. And I was like a bit like Mark, very open-ended and very flexible and I haven't changed and I think maybe it's just some more relaxed and and I I won't deny I think it's true that that um, the older I've because when I started I looked super young as well so that could also be a, like I looked 10 years younger or whatever and now that I look older so I, I think it does it's it's so it could be also experience I think experience is important I think it's I think the institution is does set a problem, like you know, as as it's been highlighted, it does set problematic relations to learning. But on the other hand, um, I think it takes time to get used to 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 how things work, and and I think once you get comfortable, that comes across as well. And um, so, it's. But of course, I think that I noticed this is a slight contradiction or problem in, in the, if we're going to look at it in capitalist terms and so on, are we trying to improve the university so that it's better at that? And so that, that's kind of a, a tension that I'm noticing here. Anyway, it's, I don't want to talk too much. 
Yeah, they, I just to jump in and people interrupt me if you have ideas on this, but um, yeah, the, the, I mean, Anthony and I talk about this a lot, um, obviously very inspired by um, the Moulton and Harney book, the, the Under Commons, um, you know, and the, and the question of, you know, and Janine, you too, you know, you even started your, your presentation from the outset being like, I don't think that the neoliberal university is a place where we can do this. Um, and yet, at the same time, yeah, there's this hesitancy to completely abandon the institution. Um, you know, for so my own experience, um, you know, as like, you know, it's to be perfectly frank, it's kind of a miracle that I am where I am right now. Um, and that's, you know, very much like I, I, you know, I dropped out of high school and I worked into, into my 20s at like factories and stuff. And I never, it was only like in, in my early 20s or at 19 or something, I was like, I love learning. <laughs> like, I, why, like, why I should, and I kind of just asserted myself. I was, I, I recognized that I just, I love learning and that, you know, even if I didn't fit into a particular mold that I still like deserve to be, you know, to, to, to have an education. And so, um, you know, I went back, I, I finished, I got a diploma and I got myself into university and, and eventually, and it was really awkward at first, um, I, because I obviously was missing a lot of uh, skills. I didn't know how to, how to operate in this new space. Um, there all the, the professionalism and stuff. It was just a very different world from what I was used to. Um, and, you know, I just, but I had that sort of love of learning. And so I managed to sort of just teach myself how to fit in and now I can pass. I feel, you know, I, I, I am an academic, I can, I can sort of own that now, um, but it was a learning experience. And, um, you know, I can say that for me, the reason, the, the, you know, why I came to, to the university and the reason I want to be in the university forever is because I view it as a sort of sanctuary um, from like the the world of capitalism and having to work at the freaking factory every day of my life because that was my reality before um and eventually i was like no i can't do this anymore i need i want to read <laughs> and so like you know the the escape i viewed it as a sort of escape i was like wow i can get this magical thing called a student loan which i don't know how i'll ever pay back but i'm gonna do it um <laughs> and i'll just i'll just figure it out later and so I think that for myself and for other students that, that did take advantage of that sort of opening up um, and the fact that we could get student loans. Um, when I was like 13, I, I just assumed I would never be able to go to university because I wasn't rich. Um, so when I found out that student loans existed, <laughs> it was really exciting. And so I viewed it like this sort of place I could go run away from like all of my horrible jobs that I had worked for like 10 years full time. Um, and, 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 you know, read books all day. And yeah, like, and, and you know, now as a graduate student, it's like, I feel like I'm living this dream. And so I have this extreme, you know, I, I do sort of, I think that there is hope in the university, but I think that the key is, is, is divorcing it as some trying to wrestle it as much as we can away from elitism, away from the, the sort of capitalist, you know, system. Like, I think that there is, um, I have some hope, I suppose, because of what I, what I like to call the sort of infiltration of the ivory tower over the last couple decades, um, that there are more and more brilliant, bright students that just love learning and love ideas, um, that are able to make their ways into these halls, um, thank goodness to things like student loans and stuff, and hopefully more and more will, and that with that sort of power, the numbers hopefully eventually we can try to find a way to like to wrestle uh to take to take over essentially but um it's like a revolution in in ivory tower <laughs> so that's my sort of hopeful idealistic um you know dream but i do you know especially as i as i kind of move along and now that i'm in my my graduate studies i do kind of see the way that it beats you down it beats you down and you get used to it like you got to get used to playing the game and you do sort of start adjusting yourself in the you know the constant competition um i find myself having to suppress certain parts of my my intellectual being you know like my emotional intellect my sort of like yeah my affective intellect my my like physical 
you know, intellect, which I, I think it's, it's all like a cohesive whole. And so, but I find that those parts of me, I have to suppress in order to just function and get through the very rational, um, <laughs> um, one tiny part of my brain that is rewarded in that competitive, very particular model of university. So um, that's another thing that I think uh, will have to be addressed, obviously, but, uh, but yeah, it's very hard to, to resist that sort of gradual, um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to call, it, but you, do, yeah, you do sort of eventually. Sometimes I worry that five years from now, I'll forget I even had these thoughts. I'll just be so used, like I'll just <laughs> lose those, 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 those um, earlier sort of reflections that I had as a sort of outsider coming in. Anyhow, uh, so I'm going to stop talking because I'm talking too much, and uh, let other folks jump in. I didn't see who put their hands up first. Kate or Aaron? Kate. Sure. <laughs> all right. Um, well, first of all, thank you uh, to all the presenters um, for their pieces, um, giving, giving us lots to, um, to think about and really interesting connections between the four presentations. Um, I guess possibly just because of the recency effect, I was thinking about the paradoxes um, that, Mark, that Mark laid out. And um, I was just thinking about another another paradox. Um, when I teach, it's it's usually writing specifically, so that you know that kind of offers its own um, unique challenges. But um, I was thinking about um, I took the instructional skills workshop, which is this workshop that universities all over Canada put on for instructors, which instructs you how to instruct, and um, you know a lot of the people leading these. Uh, instructional skills workshops that have business backgrounds and sort of, yeah, best practices totally <laughs> uh, battle uh, business models, um, like really the kind of things they teach you are to keep things short, um, small segments, and lots of stimulation, which are the same principles that apply to my four year old niece right now. Um, so I was just thinking about another paradox between pushing limits, pushing boundaries, thinking, you know, beyond previous thoughts, like opening up new space to ask um, questions, but then also these models of like, you know, keeping it simple and short and stimulating. So just another paradox to throw in there. Okay, you can go ahead, Erin, if you want. Yes, I'm up. Hi, um, I'm really, really glad that uh, I think it was Kate said something right before me because I'm also an academic writing person. In addition to being faculty in English, I'm the director of the academic writing program, and so I was really struck by the fact that this uh, panel started with Anthony saying that one of the things that he was seeing was students ill-equipped to write a basic grammatical sentence. Um, one of the things that struck me about that is that any sentence is by its very nature grammatical and whether it's not whether it's problematically grammatical or not is actually dependent on audience and this gets into all kinds of questions about ideas of elitism and gatekeeping and insider and outsider discourse um there, there's a lot of things that were presented today and a lot of language that was presented today that wouldn't be clear or comprehensible to anyone outside of this community that doesn't mean it's ungrammatical and so it it seems to me that one of the things that um, maybe 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 the paradox model is a really useful um, concept to introduce here, that it seems to me that a lot of these discussions um, that that center around you know critical pedagogy or what we're doing at a university, um, often jump to the questions of what faculty at the highest levels are doing or what instructors at the highest levels are doing. And that even though graduate students are in many, many ways precarious, that graduate students also have a somewhat privileged place within the university because there is a sense of a defined role. 
But the reality is that at this point, approximately 70% of the people who are actually delivering instruction at, at universities are sessional instructors, are precarious instructors, who, who are literally the proletariat of, of the university, and who are the people who are most embedded within neoliberal structures and the least equipped to be able to change them. And so it seems to me that you know some discussion of what there is to learn from the people who are actually doing that on the ground work where, where that is actually what they have been tasked with and thinking critically about the ways in which their work is defined, thinking about alliances, thinking about community building, that the kind of community building that needs to happen is not just within an individual classroom, um, not just between an individual instructor, not just trying to think critically about the relationship between an instructor um, of any gender, of any kind of power dynamic and students, but actually the fact that um, universities have evolved as a hierarchical system and that most of the people who are here are in many ways at the top of that hierarchy and haven't done um, a lot to um, uh, collaborate with or learn from or listen to the people who are lower down in the hierarchy, which is actually not students, it's, it's sessional faculty. Um, and so that's something that I was interested in seeing if any of the panelists wanted to think about, because I can tell you that as the director of a program that is basically 80% sessional instructors, and I am encouraging them to engage in critical pedagogy, and in fact, encouraging them to say to, to begin to realize things like um, first year academic writing courses are set up to be gatekeepers. That is actually why universities set these up. We're, we're supposed to be keeping people out so that that way people teaching upper level courses don't have students who can't write a grammatical sentence or don't know how to write a mutt genre like a five paragraph essay, which is nonsense. Um, but I'm also working with instructors who are saying that's all well and good and I believe in all of that and I believe in all those values and I'm going to lose my job if my evaluations aren't strong. Or I will lose my job if students complain because I am a precarious employee. So I'm, I'm interested in thinking about university culture um, across those kinds of power dynamics. Responses directly to, to what Erin said? Um, I, I would like just to maybe get a very brief answer to that uh, because that is like very much reflecting a lot of uh, what I was saying. Uh, trying to emphasize, and I work as a sessional instructor, and I know very well <laughs> these struggles because of course it is always, and I guess the others who were talking about teaching, oh, I think we are all sessionals here, uh, because of course it's always super insecure um, if you're having a course or not, it's, you know, it's a precarious uh, situation. And um, it's a precarious situation where we are all always in a competition against one each other because when we say, well, I'm not gonna teach this course in that way, or I gonna change or whatever, the syllabus, I change whatever. And I do that in a conflict. There is a lot of other people waiting to take my job. So um, I'm very replaceable. Um, and it's a constant struggle to make oneself irreplaceable because you're so good, so brilliant, you publish so much. And that's like just the, way into academics and in the end i think all of us know there is not so many tenure positions as there are graduate students so we all know that for i guess two-thirds of our cohort there is no academic future um at least not where we want maybe over some other ways but and that is stressful and um i think um and that is why I think it's so hard in this institution of university and all it has within all the values, all the elite, all the ivory tower, even as Erin says, there is ways now to like sneak in somehow. Um, in the end, it, in the end, capitalism is such a weird thing that it even starts to benefit from those who are like sneaking in academics by saying, look how great we are. We have diversity now. And now we have diversity management and now we put that on our flags and everybody and have additional diversity grants for the two students who made it um, in that ivory tower. And so that's incorporated in that elitist 
uh, corporate idea now. And um, so that is why I'm very skeptical on if there is really a way forward. I would love to. I, of course, it's provocative to say that there is none, but um, I would love to, of course, if we could like organize ourselves in a way that overcomes that or creates other ideas of higher education. Yeah, I was just wondering, I, I was just wondering, Aaron, how you felt when you were asking that question, um, how you sort of felt inside yourself, sort of as a being as you were asking that question and 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 why and and what uh, what it was from your felt sense that made you want to ask it. Um, I want to ask that because I actually think that this is a kind of um, that this kind of panel is a performance and it's people performing for each other and for themselves. And that's useful. I mean, I believe in performance. I, I research drama. I think performance. I, I actually asked how you felt, not what you, I actually asked how you yeah, felt. I'm not going to answer that question because it's really none of your business. Um, well, it seems like you're quite angry for some reason. And I just yeah, wonder. I'm, I'm actually you... angry because I, I really thought that there were some things that were said that were not respectful of students. Okay, so could you could you be more specific? Like, if there's something with me, just tell me. I don't. I'm I'm fine being angry, like with somebody being angry. I, I, just I think that it's angry. not respectful of students to. Um, I mean, I understand that theory always generalizes. That that is by its very nature how it deals with ideas, and that's fine. That seems like a generalization in and of itself. What theory? I'm aware of that, and I'm not really interested in playing gotcha. I mean, I do think that there there were moments in which, um, so for example, I thought that Mark was really, really open to the sense of, you know, students having to sit with paradox and being uncomfortable, and 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 spoke to how hard it is to sit with that. And I was really struck by Janine talking about kind of this very, very, very difficult ethical question. I have to admit, I was turned off from the very beginning by, by the beginning of an invocation of like, oh, you know, students can't write. And it's like, can't they? Is so, that true? Can, can, I, I, can I intervene? Is your name with me or with Anthony then? I just can said I Anthony. Okay. Um, and, and frankly, I mean, your paper was, it was fine. It was fine. It was just fine. I mean, I'm just, it, 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 it wasn't very interesting to me. It, it wasn't really getting at stuff I'm particularly interested in, but it was fun. Can I jump in here? It's pretty wonderful. It's, it's so, it's so nice to hear that kind of respectful dialogue. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll first, I want to get to a chair and give a chair a chance to talk. Um, I'll just address Aaron, your, um, I think that what you were, what you latched on about the the students not being able to write comment or not being able to construct grammatical sentences, I um, I'll I'll answer to, to that for if Anthony and I talk about this all the time. I think that Anthony was trying was actually trying to articulate something that I was wrestling with as a first year TA um, and being sort of like very saddened by the fact that I can't give students the amount of energy and attention that I want to in order to help them learn what I, I also never had help learning, which was how to communicate my ideas to another person. And I think that I, I it's interesting what you said about the gatekeeping um, in terms of writing, because I feel that so intensely and I really want nothing more than to help students break through that and be able to like, it, for me, it's all about, about about relationships. It's always about relationships, and the communication of ideas is is so important. So when I try to teach writing, or when I think about trying to teach writing, it's more about like, are you getting some? Are you engaging in a relationship with a, a potential reader, right? In terms of communicating, and uh, yeah, I feel like I feel I felt really sad by how much I could see students struggling in, in first and second year courses and, and I just wanted to be able to give them as much attention as I could to give them the skills that I've learned over this like struggle of the last 10 years in my own undergrad um, to, 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 to learn how to, to write in a way that would be accepted at, at the university because I want them to stay. I don't want them to get gatekeeped, get, like, kept out, but I'm, I'm not allowed to. I'm not given the hours to, and there's that precarity that comes in as well. Um, it's like, no, you just, just all you have like 10 minutes per, per paper, for example, to grade it. And I'm like, I can't, so I've been just taking my own time 
staying up late weekends in order to give students genuine feedback to actually help them. And I've getting I've, so many students have sent me emails saying, oh my God, thank you. No one has ever told me that or pointed that out to me or helped me with that before. Like I've never gotten this sort of feedback and it's really helping me. Um, and it's just, it's so unfortunate because I can't do that and get paid for it. <laughs> like I have to, in order to give them that, which they obviously want and they appreciate. Um, and, and I feel like I'm in more of a relationship with them when I do, but to do that is entirely, you know, on my, on my free time. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to stop there because I really want uh, Chaya to get a chance to weigh in here. So. Yeah, I'm like completely, um, I have like a completely different point altogether from all this um, discussion. But I was just thinking about like, what is the purpose of university? Because I had, um, in my undergrad, when I was doing economics, I had an yearly system. So we had like five courses that we were supposed to study throughout the year. And then when I went in my law undergrad, we had semester systems, which was like six months to five courses. And it was really interesting for me when I came here, when I had like four months to five courses, if I could take five, but I took like three at that time. And it was like three courses and four months to it. So my major objective that shifted from like a one year course program to a four month course program was, I need to just work here for the grades and instead of learning something. So I feel like this whole shift was very difficult for me to observe because I personally just wanted to go to the university to learn something. And in that early system, I could do that because I had the luxury of reading beyond my course as much as I wanted. And I could do like extracurricular activities and stuff like that. So it didn't feel like this is just a training to become a clerk in a capitalist society versus the four month stressful period that I had that I had to just like, okay, so tick, 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 done, productive or non-productive. So yeah, so I, I really feel like what Mark and Sarah were saying because Sarah taught me a course. And I remember like it was so interesting when we would just discuss things. But when I had to look at it from like, what am I supposed to do list? It was easy for Sarah's class because she was like very open to us giving submissions anytime. But like with other professors where we were like weekly submissions. So you weren't really able to reflect on the material as much as you wanted to. So yeah, I think that's what I've been thinking throughout the. Um, can I briefly respond to that? Thanks for the question, Akshaya. Um, I think my initial thoughts on that are that it's really difficult to reduce the university to any one purpose. Uh, I think that it is also always going to be the type of institution that harbors contradictions, multiplicities, and we've seen a lot of those tensions come out today. So Janina did an excellent job of showing us all of the kinds of contradictions that arise through marketization and, and these kinds of uh, incentives um, that, that kind of draw on the university. Um, we've also talked a little bit, kind of going back to some of uh, Aaron's comments about the idea of the university as a sanctuary. And I think that this is something that resonates with a lot of us. Um, and that is certainly is something that stuck with me in, um, in that piece, which I just briefly mentioned at the top of my remarks, but that Aaron referenced as well, which is um, Harton and Moni, sorry, M Moten and Harney's The Undercommons, um, where they say, I, I might butcher the quote, but it's something to the effect of, um, we, 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 cannot deny that the university is a place of refuge, but we cannot accept that it is a place of enlightenment. And, and it is this kind of conjunction, which I think it is, it's, it's very difficult to, to wrestle with because those students who are taking to the university as a place of sanctuary, as a place of refuge, which is a totally valid reason to be there. And I'm with the other presenters on this panel. I think when I say that I have no interest in in gatekeeping to hold these students out. I want to, as Mark stated, um, along with Haraway, kind of stay with the trouble and hold that space and make the university um, a genuinely kind of supportive network for these individuals and these bright minds to flourish. Um, 
this is also, I think, one of the, the difficult tensions. I mean, when we're conceiving of the, of the undercommons, yes, it consists almost entirely of those um, precarious professors of that academic precariat. And I'm so I'm speaking here as well as a, as a sessional prof in my first ever limited term appointment. Um, and my position there has been kind of interesting in that uh, I'm teaching philosophy courses. And in some ways, philosophy at the level of a discipline, if you can look at all, um, all sorts of, kind of humanities disciplines as kind of disproportionately exposed to this precariousness that is ripping through the university, uh, philosophy is kind of strangely shielded from that as being very close to the core of the humanities disciplines, right? And I and as an individual am as well by dint of things like my white maleness. Um, so I have to kind of recognize that as well. But it raises all these questions as, um, you know, in terms of what am I trying to do as, as an educator in some way it's in a discipline like philosophy, yes, my, my evaluations are uh, ultimately going to turn on how successfully I can educate these students in writing a certain type of uh, argumentative academic essay in regurgitating the arguments of Kant or Locke or any other kind of number of thinkers. But I'm trying to also not only problematize canon while doing this, but problematize the idea of, of literary, literary kind of uh, competencies and um, the methods of evaluation that we use to judge our students ourselves. Because and now I'm gonna kind of get back to, to speaking to Aaron's comments because I'm actually like totally sympathetic and I wanted to weigh in, but I was very sensitive to other people who have their hands up. And, you know, I have, um, on the one hand, you, you want to be able to open yourselves to all the different kinds of literacies that students are developing to be able to uh, evaluate based on one huge thing was the loss of in-class participation as part of the grade, which I've had to now shoehorn into a writing model in an online discussion board, which immediately is problematic for all different kinds of students coming into this in, in a number of different ways. Aaron and I have also talked, and I have to thank Aaron because so many conversations between us over cups of tea brewing with stacks of grading amassed on our desk were the inspiration for this panel. Um, and you know, you know, we talked at the beginning of the semester of, well, can you do things like video evaluations, recorded conversations with students as a way of giving feedback? And I had a really hard time trying to, to just come to terms with that in that I was very inclined to at the one level, but it's again, the difficulty of presenting a kind of consistent numerical evaluation to something like that in my discipline. So it's very much a kind of disciplinary reality and bearing that I'm struggling with here as well as this broader kind of pressures of the of the university. Well, I'm actually at Camosun College, but um, these kinds of broader pressures that are pushing down on us. And I think bringing a lot of these contradictory things that we think the university is to a, to a, to a breaking point. Uh, that was longer than I intended to talk, but um, <laughs> I'll leave the floor open. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just point out to folks that um, I think formally we said seven, but uh, I, I kind of had the sense that like most of us are um, interested in these conversations. So I intend on just chatting with folks. Um, but you know, if anyone is like, okay, I'm ready to leave, feel free to leave. Um, but Kate, I saw you had a, a hand up if you wanted to weigh in. I did, but I have withdrawn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> I just wanted to say that this was such a good opportunity to really test a lot of the theorizing that I was positing um, in my lecture and over the course of um, the year of thought and reflection with Dr. Beaton. So it was uh, it was such a gift, and I want to thank you, Dr. Kelly, for your really thoughtful remarks. I found those so helpful, um, and it was really really useful to have that kind of thoughtful critical engagement with my work and as a person who's you know a graduate student it's so helpful to have this kind of nurturing caring um, leadership exhibited by by a woman like yourself who does occupy a position of power and i feel so grateful so thank you thanks well, so I guess much. I, I would th thank you for your kind words but more than that i want to say you know thank you for taking something in the spirit of I mean, there are times when I feel like I do get worked up in these kinds of conversations and but it's because it matters. My God, it matters yeah. so much. It matters so you, much. You sound and, so passionate and genuine. It's and so wonderful so, to see that. Yeah, 
and and so I'm absolutely delighted, you know, to to, to that this that this panel was here, and I can really tell that you know this is a group of people who are thinking about the big questions and the things that matter and the ways in which we can try to do things better. Um, so you know, I I what 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 a lovely way to end a a mm -hmm. long 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 day. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So thank, thanks. Oh, 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 oh. So great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank, thanks everyone for coming. Like I, um, I, yeah, I really appreciate being able to have these sorts of conversations. My hope, and I think our, our sort of visions for hosting something like this was because I feel like most of us are thinking this, the students are thinking this, the graduate students are thinking it, the faculty are like, a lot of people in the university are having these feelings and, and, and thinking about them. And so, you know, and yet we often don't have the time to actually just like really hammer it out together in like a semi-formal setting, like other than just over coffee with one or another friend or so. Um, but also not, we don't, I didn't, we didn't want it to be sort of a, a rigid sort of like, you know, conference or there's like a goal or yeah, best practices or like in a setting of like developing policy or something like that. Because I think these sort of more um, free flowing, uh, you know, conversations that are still structured in a way where you're bringing together people that may not have ever spoken to each other before so there's still um uh, interactions happening that are new it's not just but the you know the hope ideally is that through having more and more of these sorts of conversations that they we, we will begin building those sorts of solidarities um because i do have hope um that you know there can be a sort of revolution of the university um i am obviously i before before coming to the university, in addition to being a the working and such, I was also I also come from a sort of grassroots activist background, and so I have that sort of like zesty uh, passion, and that I very much believe in in, in organizing. I think that um, there's enough energy um, and enough people feeling the same things that uh, with <laughs> with enough sort of. Uh, relationship building, um, there, there is hope. The, 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 the challenge, of course, is always that within this certain, this particular model of neoliberalism, our time is robbed from us repeatedly. And so, and time is necessary for organizing. So um, that's, that's the challenge. But uh, so, so again, with that said, thank you so much for your time, <laughs> for making the time to come and have this conversation, everyone. And thanks again to all of the panelists as well. Yes. We're so, so thrilled to have all of your talks. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. I'm just going to take that as my.